Well, I think it's a, it's a lot of things. It's, it's all of his friends, uh, his family, his associates, uh, all of the people who contributed to him as a man before he became president, but then those people who surrounded him uh, during the presidency itself. Well, one of the things that we thought would be helpful in taking a remote character and making him more accessible as a human being would be to see him through the eyes of those people who worked most closely with him, as well as those who cared about him the most. And that includes his family and uh, his, his, those people who were his personal secretaries, who stayed with him, uh, in the case of Tobias Lear, uh, virtually his entire uh, adult life after the revolution. Lear was there uh, all the way through with a, a few gaps. Otherwise, we see through these people Washington acting as a, as a human being, as a man who, who had uh, problems with his temper, uh, who cared deeply, uh, did not always show it, but also a Washington who was more intellectually acute than often is, is, uh, is portrayed. And what about him uh, would inspire such loyalty among his circle? Uh, from his youth, uh, there were people who, who did uh, generally circle him in a way. Uh, he, was, he, he was the kind of person who did inspire a great deal of loyalty uh, and was generally loyal to his friends, too. Uh, though, as we point out, there's some, there's some notable exceptions to that where where Washington um, decided that maybe that certain people in his circle were not as valuable to him and the country uh, as he had earlier thought. He didn't really expect them to not get along. Uh, they did not know each other very well at the beginning, and of course Jefferson was not even in the country at the beginning, so he came in kind of late. Um, and so he, he did not anticipate that there would be this rivalry. And apparently they did not either. Uh, that it, at first, for the first few months after Jefferson actually took his place, they did seemingly uh, get along. That, it, that it, it happens later. And, how, and it caught Washington by surprise, uh, I think. And one of the things that, that we emphasize uh, in the book is that, that Washington wanted harmony. Uh, and so as this rivalry became, and I think at first he didn't even realize that it was happening, but as it became apparent that it was happening, uh, I think it, it greatly disturbed him and that that is one thing that he, he desperately wanted in his administration was harmony. Uh, and of course he wasn't going to have it. Yeah, he was, uh, as, as the, the uh, revelations of this in, uh, pretty intense dislike between him and Jefferson emerged. Washington was um, at last aware of it, but he did not necessarily want it to uh, cause a rupture in his official family because of how it would appear. This, the stability of the government in terms of continuity of, in, in office, uh, even if it did not exist, the appearance of harmony, mm -hmm. he thought, was, was quite important. As much, as much so as, as if it didn't exist, even more so, that it appeared that way. So when Jefferson tried to resign, Washington talked him out of it, even though it would have been um, certainly a, a more congenial atmosphere if Jefferson and Hamilton had not been so at daggers with each other. Well, they had known each other since the Revolution, and I think the fact that they were friends uh, from the revolution helped in that relationship. Uh, and as we point out initially, uh, Washington did not know exactly what to do with Edmund Randolph as Attorney General because he had John Jay uh, as the Chief Justice. Uh, and he saw him as being a uh, perhaps more important advisor along those lines, whereas Randolph was more uh, a personal legal advisor to the to the president, um, but gradually, as we do point out, that that Jay saw himself and he saw uh, the court as a separate branch of the government, which of course that's what it was intended to be, 
And so therefore, it really wasn't appropriate for him to be an advisor to the president, uh, because that, that did, in, in many ways, violate separation of powers. And Jay was, they were, uh, as you know, Jay uh, was, was asked, there was an inquiry about neutrality. And uh, that was the, the first shock when, when they had to a man, the, he and the associate justice, they said, no, we're not offering an opinion, except under case circumstances. And, and there's good reason for that, because the court cannot deal in hypotheticals in as much as what it does is, is a, uh, has a finality to it. It doesn't have the, it did not have the finality to it that it does now. I mean, this is a law of the land idea. It wasn't that much to it, but the court was established as a judicial body, and it was not to be used as a sounding board, a political sounding board. And that was made quite clear. Now, Jay, uh, Washington uh, really did have a great deal of affection for John Jay, because Jay had helped him during some really grim times during the Revolution. Jay was a careful, prudent patriot who was slow to come to the idea of independence, but once there, was completely uh, uh, committed to the idea. And uh, his work on behalf of the Continental Army during the darkest days of 1777-78 uh, permanently endeared him to Washington, as, as it did Governor Morris the same way. I think he would have been a lot more important if he had been in the country. Uh, but since he spent the entire presidency uh, abroad that they could not consult on a regular basis. They did exchange a good many letters and they were very frank letters, uh, which kind of gives you an idea of what kind of advisor and the, the kind of person he would have been in the circle if he had been, been in the country. Uh, because Washington had a, a tremendous amount of affection for Mars and a great deal of respect. Again, even though they were personally very different people. I mean, Washington was, as we repeatedly say, a very aloof, formal person, uh, whereas Governor Morris was a, a very outgoing, uh, very sophisticated, uh, but very sarcastic man. He, he did not suffer fools well, uh, and so that they, they were very different in many ways. Though so physically, uh, people said that they, they actually resembled each other quite a bit, that they were about the same size. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Houdon used Morris as his body model for the famous statue once he was back in, in France because they were uh, of a similar size. Uh, though, of course, Morris was missing one of his legs, which Houdon ignored that. And kept that under wraps. Yes. Um, but, and again, a very happy-go-lucky, kind of fun-loving man who never met a stranger and uh, Loved the ladies, uh, very much so. In fact, perhaps a little bit too much, hence the leg problem. Uh, but uh, they, they were very, very close. Well, that's close. the story. That's the story, that's the story yes. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, I think Morris was probably one of the closest people to Washington in terms of candor mm -hmm. and, and frankness, uh, that he was able to say things to him that even his, uh, even close friends such as Robert Morris, uh, had to tread somewhat lightly around Washington, and Morris didn't. Although the story about the slap on the back is apparently apocryphal. That never happened. There's no documentation. It was in, seems to have been an invention of the mid-19th century, uh, the story that Morris had been given a wager that he could be familiar with Washington, and he called him George and slapped him on the back and got a, a stare that would have uh, frozen, you know, frozen over hell. Uh, that did not happen, and I, I, I can see where it would, and I don't think Morris would have crossed that line either. I think it's, it's hard to say how Martha Washington shaped the presidency uh, because we don't really know what their relationship was like when they were alone together. Um, we know that she took a deep interest in everything about him, uh, that she was fiercely protective of him. Uh, but as far as how she shaped the presidency, we only can see it from, from the, sort of the external signs. Uh, for instance, uh, as we say, she's the female face of the presidency uh, during those eight years. And uh, 
she comported herself with a great deal of dignity, but also warmth. I mean, there was no one who uh, became acquainted with Mar Martha Washington uh, who did not develop great affection for her. And so she was kind of the warm side of the couple. Uh, she was not aloof, uh, as, as we say, that she, uh, uh, if she did not embrace people literally, she certainly did emotionally. And uh, as a result, did humanize the presidency in that way. She was a delightful companion by all accounts, uh, completely unassuming and unpretentious, and, and perfectly willing uh, to, uh, to shoulder the burdens, the social burdens uh, of, the, of the office uh, without complaint except to a very close group of family. And from that we know that she found them to be very burdensome, very onerous, and frequently uh, she pined to go home. Uh, she, uh, Abigail did. Abigail Adams went home, and she did not come back. She was not in Philadelphia uh, during the entire time that the presidency was based, the capital was the temporary capital of the day. Uh, Martha never deserted her post, and she frequently, during the Revolution, was in considerable danger uh, going to and from Mount Vernon to wherever he was. Um, many people thought this marriage loveless, uh, a companionate marriage at best, but um, they, they did not realize that these two people would move mountains to be with each other. And um, Henrietta Liston, the wife of the British minister who succeeded George Hammond, was very, fairly close to the Washingtons despite the brevity of their acquaintance. And she went to see, she and her husband went to see Martha after Washington died, and she was shocked because she'd always thought it was a companionate marriage. This woman, she said, I, she's grieving herself to death. Indeed, she was. And she grieved herself to death after he died and did not look much beyond it, as she said she wouldn't then at, at his bedside. Even his biographer, uh, paints uh, a, a sketchy picture of him. <laughs> it's, it's sad because he seems to have been a troubled man, um, and by all accounts he committed suicide in, at the end of his life, although that seems to have been more from uh, physical distress than mental anguish. Uh, there was something wrong with him, and I think he, he couldn't take the pain. Um, he came very, as a very young man to, to Mount Vernon to tutor the children, uh, Nellie and Wash. Uh, and uh, became Washington's secretary as a consequence of that that wasn't enough for him to do, to tutor the children. And Washington's books were in disarray. Lund, his uh, cousin, had been looking after Mount Vernon during the Revolution. And when Washington came home, the thing was a bloody mess. It, uh, nothing tallied, nothing balanced. He was deeply in debt. And so Lear came in and took care of that, as well as began taking care of the correspondence. He was uh, Harvard educated, uh, something of a polyglot, and uh, good with the children. Martha adored him because he was very kind to her and helped her write letters because she was very nearly illiterate. Uh, her education had been dancing in schools and things like that. So he was able to help her with that sort of thing and do it in a way that was not at all condescending. And he. Uh, I don't think he cared for Washington at first no. uh, because Washington did tend to be aloof, especially with employees, and that's essentially what he was early on. Uh, but the, the devotion to Washington that he developed uh, was, was, it was almost beyond hero worship. Uh, he just, he had a tremendous amount of affection for Washington, but also he was very protective uh, I mean, what he did during the presidency, and I, I, we try to, to make this clear, is, I mean, he's called a secretary, but he really was the equivalent of what we would call today chief of staff. Uh, he handled all of the, the details of the household, uh, as well as uh, important correspondence with Congress and uh, diplomats. I mean, he did, he did so many things that we'll probably never even know uh, completely, and, and wore himself out in the process. Uh, and plus, he was never treated outside of the household, I think, with the respect that he was inside the household. And that, that's why he did, 
experiment with leaving, uh, particularly he was planning to leave before she died, but when his wife Polly died suddenly in, in 1793, he kind of sped up those plans. But he never, as we point out, he never really found his way uh, and until he found his way back to the Washingtons and, of course, was working uh, for Washington, again, as his secretary when Washington died and he was there uh, in the house. And then I think that in some ways that untethered him uh, and he never really was going to be, be comfortable in any other job that he had after that. He also found Jefferson very congenial and that uh, became a problem especially after Jefferson's departure from the administration. Uh, Lear and Jefferson philosophically were quite compatible. And um, he became a Jeffersonian, which estranged him from, the, from Martha and the rest of the family, even though he had married uh, uh, Fanny. Fanny and then, uh, and then another, uh, niece, uh, yeah. another niece uh, when Fanny died. Uh, that... Uh, uh, that is a tragedy. There's always the, the, the surrounding aura of some sort of uh, mystery or intrigue about Lear as a result of that, I think, because he's often blamed for purging the papers, for going into the papers and doing things to them, possibly at the behest of Jefferson. Uh, and there's no evidence for that, other than the speculation that, that he might have done this because he did become a Jeffersonian. And the division on that score was so, so, so much of a significant and dire, that once crossed over into the, you became an apostate to the, to the people who had left and they, they never forgave him. Um, Lear was careless about some things. He, he stole from Washington. Uh, he, he didn't actually put his hand in the till, but he redirected some rent money into his own accounts. And uh, when Washington saw this in the ledgers and confronted the people who he thought were in arrears, they told him that they paid Lear. And Lear had to com confess that he had been short and had been, as a consequence, in need of funds. And this seemed to be a, an unauthorized loan, which, oddly enough, it would any other human being in the world, it would have been an irreparable breach. But for Washington with Lear, no. He, he forgave him and uh, said to continue as always, as he did. And Lear was with him when he died. I, the idea that this is a completely blank slate, uh, everything is new. And <clears throat> uh, we have written elsewhere about, uh, about this, uh, the, the great fortune the country had in someone who was like George Washington, who realized this and then surrounded himself with people who were equally cognizant of the significance of every single move, ma major and minor. Um, we've likened it to someone sitting down at a desk with a blank sheet of paper in which the, everything they write is indelibly and unerasable, that it is, it is in, in place and will not just affect what's going on right then with that sentence, but all the other sentences that will follow it forever. And that that kind of challenge would, in someone sitting at a piece of paper, create an incredible writer's block uh, for someone who's establishing a new government in the, in the uncharted seas of, of domestic and international affairs. Uh, well, it's no wonder that he didn't want to do it. Washington tried every other artifice and stratagem to avoid the presidency and was finally uh, dragooned into the job and tried to leave it as soon as he could. He actually thought he would only be there for two years, that he would get the, the ball rolling and then go home. And then, of course, all, all things happening didn't allow that even after four years. So I think probably the idea of setting so many precedents that would be so indelible in the way the government ran was one of the things that is most remarkable about the, the first presidency. And I think, as far as policy issues, obviously the first one, the, and, and perhaps the most daunting, was the, the uh, financial issues. And the country was not only broke, it was heavily in debt. And, uh, of course, picking Alexander Hamilton uh, to, to head the Treasury Department, which, of course, was not necessarily, it was certainly he was not his first choice, that Robert Morris was, mm -hmm. was probably his first choice. 
um, that, that it was so fortunate uh, because Hamilton was able to, uh, to certainly not pay off the debt, but to, to take care of those issues in a logical way, uh, a very planful way, uh, that, that certainly put him at odds with Jefferson uh, and others, Madison first. Um, but doing that in the way that he did and then trusting, and the part of George Washington, trusting Hamilton uh, to handle, because Washington was not a numbers guy. Uh, this, uh, this was one area that he, uh, I won't say was happy to turn over to someone else, but but it was not something that he felt particularly comfortable with. And so I think that was the first policy issue uh, that was going to, to uh, really start the presidency off on a, on a very good footing. Uh, and I think a lot of people realize that. Um, then, of course, there's the issues of foreign policy, which are going to dominate um, the latter part of his, his first term, but primarily his second term. Yeah, the Anglo-French War became the unforeseen but absolutely unavoidable controversy that began to affect almost everything uh, in domestic politics. Well, Washington was quite correct in that uh, war is entirely the most expensive thing a government can do. And it was the kind of thing that this government could not afford to do. Uh, he felt it would be a disaster in terms of its domestic impact, and that he thought internationally it could be quite dire, but dire enough to, to destroy the experiment. Uh, that defeat in, in a war with Britain or France was uh, a quick avenue to, to the end, to the conclusion of everything. Nothing else would follow. So he was committed uh, from the outset to, um, to avoid that uh, for all of its potential uh, consequences and ramifications. Uh, the, it's interesting because neutrality was a question that came about in a way that we wouldn't think of. Um, there was a good deal of consideration that the executive had no right to issue a proclamation of neutrality any more than he had a right to declare war. This was a congressional prerogative. And there was, uh, this is one of the first fissures that begins to appear in the Jefferson, Madison, Washington uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, that, that Madison was quite troubled by this. Uh, and Jefferson was as well, so much so that they, he managed to excise the word from the proclamation so that it's technically not a neutrality proclamation. It's a non-involvement, we're standing away proclamation. <laughs> and uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was a semantical uh, concession that some people were not happy about. Hamilton wasn't, because he thought that Quite, uh, quite disruptive to Anglo-American relations, and he was highly intent on that because of the financial benefits that would come from having Britain be the principal trading partner. But that's also one of the reasons why uh, Washington, uh, in fact, he was he was here. He was at Mount Vernon mm -hmm. when he received word that Great Britain and France were were then officially at war, uh, and that. Uh, it seriously depressed him as well as alarmed him uh, because if they were at war, of course, a lot of the fighting they were going to be doing was going to be on the seas, and that would certainly disrupt American trade, and that was something that Hamilton, of course, was, was concerned about as well because the, the customs duties uh, were one of the major sources of income for the country at this time, and so that would undoubtedly cut down on those those duties. Uh, and so the Washington did rush back uh, to Philadelphia once he had heard about the war. And then that's when they started hashing out uh, the so-called neutrality proclamation uh, because they did want both sides, both the British and the French, to realize, okay, we're not part of this, so don't bother our, our ships. Let them continue doing what they... Uh, they're doing so that we can bring in the, the goods and collect the customs duties. And that's before Edmund Genet has even made it to Philadelphia. You know, he uh, landed in Charleston and then made his, ironically, kind of royal progress uh, 
uh, up to Philadelphia. So this was this was partly in getting ready for him, how they were going to to deal with him. Hamilton even suggested that since he was the the emissary of Republican France, that we should not even perhaps even receive him uh, because we had made our uh, diplomatic arrangements with the king of France, who, of course, by the time Genet arrived, the king was no more. Uh, but at least uh, Jefferson did win that point, and Washington uh, did receive Genet. And then, of course, things went downhill from there uh, after that first meeting. Uh, Washington was never going to like Genet the whole time he was here. And things only went from bad to worse. Yes. Uh, Britain um, took its sweet time sending someone. Uh, there was a, a long period uh, where we had no uh, nobody representing the Court of St. James here in the country, except for uh, quite unofficial. Uh, we had some consular people, uh, and and George Beckwith, who was a, who was a spy, uh, who who came down from Canada periodically and had tea with Hamilton, uh, but the. Uh, the appointment of a man uh, to actually come here from London in the uh, in the ministerial role uh, took them took them quite some time, and then uh, uh, when they did send some, someone, it was it was a, a child, a, a completely inexperienced diplomat who knew Thomas Jefferson quite uh, casually from their uh, residence in Paris together at some point when when George Hammond the, the young man was in in residence there as a junior diplomat and he actually seems to have thought that that uh, casual acquaintance would smooth the way it didn't Jefferson was a completely different man as secretary of state who was not uh, any more prepared to uh, to give George Hammond any favors as he was any of the the uh, the, the others um, Janae was a bit different but Janae wore out his welcome within weeks. He was a, he was a disaster. Well, part of the reason it was unpopular is that uh, the United States did not really get much from it. And uh, a lot of people had expected more, particularly trade concessions with the West Indies, uh, which were very minor. Uh, and uh, it did require that the British leave the Northwest Post, but gave them uh, a good deal of time to do that. Uh, and so I think the fact that it, it appeared to many people that Jay had not really accomplished very much. Uh, and then there were the rumors coming out of Great Britain while he was there that he had actually deigned to kiss the hand of the Queen, uh, that, in other words, that he, he was rather a submissive diplomat. Now, I'm not saying that he was, but that was the perception, uh, particularly by Westerners who believed that Jay had, during the Confederation period, had betrayed their interests with the so-called Jay-Gardoki Treaty that was never ratified, uh, that essentially gave up any use of the Mississippi River in return for trade concessions that would help the Northeast. And so they, they had never been happy about Jay going in the first place. And in fact, there were uh, stories about uh, Kentuckians actually burning him in effigy before they even knew about the treaty. Uh, and then, of course, the, the famous story that he said that he would, once he returned, that he could travel uh, the entire eastern seaboard at night by the light of his own burning effigies. Uh, that, that those people were not predisposed to accept anything that he did. And the fact that he gained so few concessions from the British seemed to reinforce those ideas in a lot of people's minds. But Washington did ultimately uh, decide, uh, after the Senate did barely ratify the treaty, to actually sign it and put it into effect, which for the Jeffersonians... Uh, sometimes called the Madisonians at this time, um, that that hurt Washington's popularity in a number of places. Treaty had a troubled history. Um, it was hard to get it here. Um, the, the copies of it were lost at sea. And finally, one of them made it back. Uh, 
And when it arrived, uh, they, uh, Randolph, uh, who was then by then Secretary of State, and Jefferson were nonplussed. I mean, uh, Washington were nonplussed. Uh, they read over this and were quite unhappy with it. It wasn't a very good agreement. And uh, the uh, the Northwest Post thing, they had a year to get out of those. And the same people who had told Jay this, that they were going to do this, had told him the same thing in 1783 in Paris when they were negotiating the, the treaty to end the war. It was, it was uh, as, as the old saying, deja vu all over again. And uh, then the secrecy surrounding it, mm -hmm. they put it under a ban of secrecy when the Senate debated it, which was uh, uh, breached almost immediately uh, and published. The thing was published, but it was published in such a way that it seemed as though it had been sneaked out. When Washington had actually authorized the publication of the treaty, they were just late doing it. So it seemed as though there was some sort of skullduggery going on about it. And then when it was finally signed, that was under the, the whip of the uh, emerging land of controversy, which also sullied it. So uh, there are those who now even say that we would have been at war with Britain had in the absence of the treaty. I don't know. I do know that James Monroe was sent over by Thomas Jefferson to essentially do the same thing as tensions were uh, increasing in 1805 and 1806. And Monroe brought back a treaty that was precisely the same sort of thing that, uh, that Jay had done. And Jefferson didn't even submit it. He put it in his desk drawer and forgot it. So there was no dealing with these people. They were, uh, they were in what they thought was an existential crisis with, uh, with first revolutionary and then Napoleonic friends. And so they were going to impress seamen, and they were going to, uh, to interrupt trade, and they were going to declare contraband uh, out of all manner of things that were going to impinge on American commerce because they could not see that anything other than that was a, 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 a de facto ally of, of the French. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how it played out. Neutrality was a myth from the very beginning. Washington brought from the revolution a sense of uh, consultation uh, with his military staff. And that is in many ways what he does when he becomes president. He treats these people as subordinates uh, and he is a chief, uh, but also as he is a chief among equals. And as a consequence, he asks for them to give him opinions on all manner of things that are outside their particular bailiwicks. This causes trouble because people who are turf-oriented, like Hamilton and Jefferson, uh, who, who do not necessarily see uh, consultation on matters in State Department or Treasury Department outside of that bailiwick to be anything other than meddling. And Washington uh, originally uh, wanted written opinions from everyone because he could find those uh, much, much easier to digest and ruminate over. Uh, and he thought meetings uh, as they do, tend to make people posture and speak glibly or off the cuff and improvise rather than think. And so his, uh, his attitudes about that had to change because people were not getting along anymore. And he thought that after, uh, after a time that if he had everyone sit down together face to face, that he could promote harmony again. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that didn't quite yeah. work out. And either. he assumed that if, if people were sitting face to face, that they would be less likely to be rude to each other and to uh, get along. And, and in some ways that, that happened, but then they did a lot of their maneuvering behind the scenes. And so that didn't really bring the harmony that he wanted. He even had them eat with the family, uh, with, uh, with Nellie and Wash and Martha and, and uh, Tobias Lear. And they would all sit down for the three o'clock meal, which was the main meal in the household. And the idea that people who do this sort of social interaction would find it more difficult to be, uh, to be uh, disagreeable in a professional one. Well, there weren't any more great American leaders in the cabinet. The closest was Edmund Randolph, who uh, took Jefferson's place at the State Department, and so he left the Attorney General's position. And uh, the other replacements, Oliver Wolcott was certainly c capable. He was uh, Hamilton's hand-picked successor uh, for the Treasury Department, and he had worked with Hamilton for the entire uh, first term into the second term. So he knew what he was doing. Uh, 
and he was uh, competent. He didn't have the creativity uh, that, that Hamilton did. He certainly didn't have the charisma. Uh, he did not have the uh, uh, sort of political connections, the kind of political clout that Hamilton had developed. And then the uh, Secretary of War, when Henry Knox uh, did leave the, the War Department, and Knox we, we describe as, as he kind of lived in the shadow of Hamilton and Jefferson uh, because they were, were so shiny and so brilliant, uh, but that he, he was quite capable uh, and did, did some very interesting things in the War Department. But when he left the War Department, by that point, Washington was having trouble getting people to even take minor posts within the government. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't pay well. Uh, all of uh, Washington's uh, first cabinet suffered financially as a result of being in the government, uh, which is why Hamilton left in the first place. He went back to the law because he could make a living uh, doing that, and Knox was broke, uh, and he needed, he had a very large family that he had to support, uh, and so he left, and Washington couldn't get anyone to take the job, and he ended up settling for Timothy Pickering, who was a very disagreeable man, um, and not particularly brilliant, not, not at all brilliant, uh, not terribly imaginative, competent, uh, but again, disagreeable. Uh, he was suspicious. Uh, he was uh, paranoid about a lot of things. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the combination of Pickering and Wolcott, two New Englanders, uh, in some ways were going to isolate Washington uh, from, from some of his closest friends. And... Uh, it wasn't necessarily an unhappy time, uh, but it, it, it really did end up surrounding Washington with virtual strangers. And so that second circle, when you're talking about the cabinet, um, is going to be a, a, a far different circle than what he started with. And that, that is true. The, the idea that Washington uh, continues in the presidency as a, uh, as a, as a linear line of accomplishment is, is sadly not true because in the second term so many things begin to impinge on, on the presidency and him personally that he reacts quite understandably but regrettably as though these are personal affronts. Uh, for the first time there are criticisms in the newspapers directly aimed at him rather than the office or the entourage or whatever. And uh, Pickering and Walcott create an atmosphere of suspicion. They are arch-federalists and, uh, and, and are quite uh, uh, brash about it to the point that they are impolitic. And we must remember they are the ones who actually begin the headlong plunge into reactionaryism with the Alien Sedition Act. So the Sedition Act of 1798 is one of the most odious pieces of legislation to and, and is within living memory of the revolution. And these were the people who sat up night going through newspapers to find people to prosecute for, for, for uh, uh, speaking their mind under protections of the First Amendment. And these are the people who are influencing the second term. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that Washington does something incredible for him that he would have never considered doing in the first term, and publicly criticizing in his annual message the democratic societies and imputing to them seditious uh, purposes. And this was a loyal opposition. And as Madison quite correctly said, and Jefferson agreed, if, if resistance to government policy is going to be regarded as uh, disloyalty, then the, the experiment is coming to an end. I see the greatest success of Washington's presidency as being um, establishing the precedents yes. that future presidents are going to build on uh, and establishing a stable government that people came to respect. Even if they did criticize it occasionally, they respected it. Uh, and as a result, those precedents of those eight years some of them may be good precedents, maybe not so good precedents, but they did establish a stable government so that when there was a contested election in 1796, uh, when you have people actually running against one another for the presidency, which didn't happen 
uh, for both of uh, Washington's presidency, there was, there was no thought that if one side didn't win, that there would be some great upheaval. Uh, and in fact, it was an extremely smooth transition uh, to the Adams presidency, which of course then brought the, the, the odd circumstance of the, the loser becoming the vice president uh, in 1796, but everyone seemed extremely congenial during that transition, which surprised people in other countries that that happened the way it did. Yes, I think possibly the greatest success Washington uh, as president was that he went home. Mm -hmm. That after two terms he, he said no more and went home. Uh, and, and we say in the book, in the opening of it, that there were probably, possibly, it's, it's a stretch, but possibly there were other people who could have beaten Britain in the revolution. Uh, but uh, it is highly unlikely that there is another person in the world who would have ended the way George Washington did by handing over his commission, uh, returning the army to Congress, and going home. Um, this was... This was unheard of. It, it, Washington was actually touted as a as a possible uh, uh, monarch in, in in a Cromwellian sense. At the end, in 1783, there were actually within his own official family people who were urging him to do this. He would have none of it. Uh, in 1793, uh, 1792, Washington wanted to go home, and he only stayed because people from completely diametrically opposed views. The polls of Hamilton and Jefferson told him if he did, the country could not survive. So he did what he had to do, and then in 1796 he insisted. And most people thought he would be president for life. They couldn't envision a landscape without him on it in the political sense. And uh, when he did say that he would not do it, it was a farewell address, of course, published in September uh, before the election, it was late enough so that it wouldn't cause any kind of disruption or stir, but still was a finality. There was a sense of that being something incredibly significant. And everybody, we mentioned that Jefferson, that Monticello read this and realized this was one of the best men that he'd ever known or would ever know. Well, we'd always admired him, yes. and we had done some work on him earlier, not, not anything to this scale, um, and uh, broached it with our editor at Random House, and he liked the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, he at first wanted, uh, brought a, the idea of a full-blown biography, and he says, well, that's been done, uh, and it's yeah. been done recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really. And so <laughs> we, we thought, because there really hasn't been a whole lot done on his presidency, only yeah. as part of those sure. biographies. Absolutely. I think the Forrest McDonald study years ago, mm -hmm. which looks mainly at the events, not the people, yeah. uh, which it's a very good book, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't focus so much on, on the people themselves. Yeah. And so when we brought that up, mm -hmm. he liked the idea. And Richard Norton Smith did the Patriarch book, yeah. which is about Washington and the mm -hmm. central role he occupies. But the idea of something being revealed as a, uh, as a uh, reflection <clears throat> on the people who were around him uh, struck us as a unique way of looking at it. And again, the, uh, I was, as we were talking earlier that the book was much longer. Uh, because we, we actually have an, almost an entire chapter on Robert Dinwiddie, uh, who was, as, as Washington was quite young, uh, is one of the more unfortunate relationships in terms of uh, Dinwiddie being pretty honorable and Washington being pretty rot rotten about things. Um, and uh, the, the, the line that we labored over and finally came, said at the very end, Dinwiddie, because he went home and became a, staunch royalist. He was intent upon parliamentary prerogative in terms of those upstart Yankees, you know. <laughs> and they said that, that, that Robert Dinwiddie's positions finally got him, George Washington got him his commission. 